Fantastic. So it looks like the live link is on on Facebook, so we can get started now. Without further ado, I'd now like to invite the opening government, specifically the Prime Minister, to open today's debate. You hear? The thesis from opening government is that NATO is a toothless organization that provides a false sense of security and antagonizes Russia into increased aggression, making countries within Europe and around the world comparatively less safe than they otherwise would be. Firstly, a brief model and comparative about what we would actually support, um, and then going into our constructive material. So in terms of defining the framework of this debate, I think that regarding the continuation of NATO is when the U.S. is sort of dissolved as is NATO, what we still think could exist are economic and other political alliances between countries, things like the EU that mean that people have common interest in defending each other's security because of economic integration, political integration. Um, we would also support like um, ad hoc political uh, uh, movements to like uh, stop specific conflicts. For example, see the U.S. rallying a bunch of allies to invade Iraq. Uh, I mean, maybe not in that particular circumstance, but the point is that ad hoc military invasions are possible absent some sort of pre-existing agreement. Um, this essentially means that in uh, specific cases, like, I don't know, stopping Bosnian genocide, maybe you'd still be able to rally support, given that it was sufficiently politically popular. We're actually going to be explaining why this sort of thing is comparatively more likely to happen on our side of the house in a way that is probably better than NATO anyways. Um, yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. So... In terms of constructive material, the first thing is that you're likely to provoke increased hostility and increased Russian expansion. Um, see like modern invasion of like Ukraine and other border states and all, all sorts of other things. Why is this? So NATO was created expressly to resist the USSR and Russia like specifically. It was about finding allied countries where you could put nuclear weapons as close to Russia as possible, the constant threat of invasion, all sorts of aggression. Uh, note that military aggression is often about optics and the need for like, to respond with shows of force when your country is feasibly being aggressed, even if you're not like legitimately under a huge amount of threat is super important because the notion that you as a country will respond proportionally or in larger proportion than some threat against you is necessary to prevent future aggression because your continued predictable behavior of responding aggressively when someone tries to threaten you means that people are less likely to threaten you in the first place, which means the existence of a large military organization that is actively trying to like get closer and closer to Russia's border as they do things like, for example, negotiate the entrance of like Ukraine into NATO and stuff like that probably means that there's a like, necessary political push on Russia to do more expansionist things. So I think Russia feeling threatened by military unity within Europe, specifically aimed at being as close to their border as possible with gaining more territory that used to be theirs in Eastern Europe and by their borders, means that they do all sorts of things to try to push back against this and the form of military and other aggression. So this is like seeking to divide countries internally and externally, uh, asserting power by reoccupying border states um, and strengthening their influences there. So installing like, I don't know, dictatorships in uh, caucuses, um, election interference, mass cyber attacks, funding like Brexit and other nationalist movement to divide alliances that are even more powerful than NATO internally. Um, and as all of this having massive negative consequences for people on the ground, all the xenophobic shit policy that comes with it. Um, and it also just literally looks like invading border states like Ukraine in, in order to like get comparatively more power while the rest of Europe turns a blind eye um, so that they can have a comparatively more ability to assert power. I'll take a POI before I go into my second point. Sure. sure. Uh, you said that Russia targets alliances that are quote unquote, even more powerful than NATO. Presumably the alliances like the EU exist on your side of the house. Do you think that Russia is scared of an EU that promotes the same security and economic commitments that in your side, Russia is so afraid of? Uh, sure. I think that the comparative though, is that the EU would likely support things like defending each other politically, but it's not necessarily as aggressive of, as a military threat because it mostly focuses on like economic integration. And because often as we already framed, like military aggression is contingent on like optics, the fact that it's a massive military alliance that was built during the Cold War for the sole purpose of like focusing on Russia as opposed to any other possible threat. I would say that comparatively the, the EU is not at all concerned about like Russia in any specific sense, it's not necessarily a military alliance, but it has the benefit that if like one major European power were to be invaded, like likely other countries would come to their aid, but it's not like an active threat on Russia in the sense that, I don't know, unless Russia is planning to invade Germany tomorrow, which they likely aren't, doesn't have any sort of optical threat to them in any massive way. But secondly, um, 
in terms of like NATO being relatively bad for providing actual safety. So NATO may like appear objectively threatening to Russia and provoke all sorts of bad things, but it doesn't actually meaningfully help countries within. So NATO countries have literally been attacked multiple times without invoking, invoking Section 5. For example, Russia bombed Turkey, Turkey recently uh, with no NATO backlash, uh, meaning that the underlying like assumptions about defense are relatively illegitimate. Why is this? Firstly, many member states don't actually want to go to war with Russia. The cost of them is enormous, and NATO enforcement mechanisms are incredibly weak. So they can't even exert enough international power to get countries to spend a certain amount of GDP on their military, let alone to send thousands of soldiers to die in a bloody conflict, which means the actual premise of mutual defense is unlikely. Member states want high thresholds for what constitutes a legitimate invasion that warrants like mutual defense, since this enables them to push off burdens for later governments, right? This means that minor like bombings or something um, like Russia did in Turkey or other like smaller invasions of like things that might be contested. Um, see Crimea, I mean, Ukraine's not in NATO, but like that sort of thing where maybe it was annexed legitimately and there's some excuse for not actually invading. Any excuse they can find in every conflict has usually like two sides nominally. And countries will find a reason not to invade because it's incredibly costly and there really aren't any strong reasons because the strength of the agreement is a public good. Um, so also they're terrible at responding to anything non-military. Like, so like mass election interference, no mechanisms to respond to it. We say that it provides a false sense of safety in the sense because um, it, it's generally like a, a public good issue, right? If functioning effectively, military strength is paid for by individuals but benefited by the collective and with weak enforcement mechanisms for people actually paying it equally. So the strong incentive is to massively reduce your military budget to the point of being able, able, unable to resist threats and banking on the fact that you'll be able to rely on your NATO allies that have some sort of international contract to agree with you as opposed to just political will that you get through an agreement like the EU, right? The notion that other countries will come to your aid means that you deprioritize your own safety. And when push comes to shove, countries will likely find any excuse possible not to help you. We would also say the fact that now that you're in NATO, coming to the aid of one of these countries is dangerously precedent setting and that it sets some threshold for what is a severe enough attack that it, con that it requires mutual defense to be invoked, which means that countries are unlikely to want to come to the aid of say Turkey if that means that they've now set the bar for what they, their future obligations will look like, right? This is why ad hoc military interventions are comparatively better in, if need be, because you could come to someone's aid that's saying this is a commitment that I will always agree to ad infinitum and try to like, you know, reduce your burdens otherwise. For that reason, you get better safety, very proud to you. Makes that speech, um, leader of the opposition. tell you that all the trade agreements and all the liberalization and all the democratization would have happened anyways, Russia would have been completely docile if it weren't for NATO and everything would have been ideal. The thing that they're missing is that trade agreements do not happen without the assurance of uh, a military stability and that Russia is likely to have been aggressive regardless of NATO's creation or not. We're going to explain these two ideas, why we think that the, uh, the military alliance was critical for actually forging this type of trade, uh, trade relations, and also why uh, uh, NATO definitely does reduce Russian aggression, but there is one extraneous point of rebuttal that we must address. The idea that uh, uh, NATO is unable to do anything in the real world. So they tell you that uh, uh, Russia attacked a bunch of NATO allies, and NATO has done nothing about this. No, this, this is factually a lie. First of all, it is just not true that Russia has uh, bombed Turkish soil, and we have no idea where they bought this idea from. And then they talk to you about Ukraine. And Ukraine is a great example for our side, because Ukraine is not a member of NATO. And that is why Russia felt comfortable that it can occupy parts of Ukraine, where it did not feel comfortable occupying the other part that they really want, which is in Estonia, or any other part of uh, Eastern Europe, which is a part of NATO precisely because the NATO is there. And how does NATO function? The thing is that because they tell you countries are very reluctant to go to war, if there is only Estonian uh, uh, people who are uh, uh, protecting the Estonian border and Russia attacks it, then France is unlikely to go to war. But if there is a French soldier who is guarding the Estonian border and that French soldier is killed by a Russian attack, then the French public will definitely be supportive of attacking them and making sure that something happens. This is the basis of NATO and this is why it is crucial for those countries' defense, and they're just factually incorrect. 
And when he tells you that NATO doesn't respond to uh, more modern things like uh, election interference and cyber attacks, this is again factually incorrect. NATO over the last years has uh, been spending more and more into cyber protection and cyber security, where they're using a lot of things that were developed in the West and in Estonia and countries that are strong like that to prevent cyber attacks. And they have been doing this for the last few years, and we think they're likely to get better is it, at it because they're investing so much more in the US. Let's talk about. Uh, um, uh, uh, trade relations and whether they're likely to be, right? Because we think that the thing is that you do not forge a trade relation with someone when you don't have the assurance that Russia is not going to uh, 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 be angry against you, right? Because we think that the thing is that Russia has a lot of power over these Eastern European countries just by the fact of them being very physically close together. And the countries are very afraid that Russia, even if it doesn't start an outright war, is going to have border disputes, going to have border clashes, going to occupy parts of the areas that have good uh, uh, water ports and good uh, uh, um, uh, uh, um, um, natural resources. And we think that also they're just afraid that Russia is going to rally up the Russian minority and try to create havoc within the state, which limits its ability to develop economically and politically. Right? We think that that means that these countries are unlikely to forge a trade alliance, which Russia, Russia might find, you know, they don't like this trade alliance because you're getting closer to, with the West and are no longer dependent on them. And we think that as a result, they will fail to create ties with these countries. Right? So we just think that all the trade deals and the EU and all the things that OJ wants to have would just not have existed because they would have been afraid that Russia is going to intervene and stop them. We think it's likely that Russia would have tried to do this. Right? And we think, we obviously agree with OG that bringing these countries close to Russia is super important because of democratization and liberalization, because of uh, the way that the West helped develop these economies and make them stronger, and because uh, of all the technology this brought in and everything that OG tells you, which think it happens much more on our side of the house. Before we continue to the second point, does CG have a POI for us? Okay, so we will continue to the second point. When you have a POI, please write it in the chat and then I will see and take you. So look, OG tell you Russia is expansionist because the West tried to uh, uh, create NATO. We think this is just, again, not true. Russia is likely to have been expansionist anyways. Notice that even before NATO ever existed, Russia was always expansionist throughout its history, in the time of the Tsars, in the time of uh, communism, ever, ever since always when there was a Russian empire, it tried to expand. Why this too? So we think that uh, um, uh, there are several reasons, right? We think that, first of all, Wait, okay, I had my papers mixed up. Right, so we think that first of all, Russia uh, doesn't have on its own access to ports that it can use. The ports that Russia used during the Soviet era and during the Soviet era are ports in Estonia, in Syria, in, uh, in uh, Ukraine, because it is, uh, all the water that it has is in the north. We need to remember that 90% of trade in the world goes through the water. And as a result, if you don't have access to a port, which you must make sure that you are the only one who has access to and no one can take that access away from you, you are unable to partake in international trade. Also, Russia doesn't have a defensible border against you, right? We think that uh, it knows that it cannot be defended because there is no like natural mountain range or rivers or anything like that. We think that Russia knows that over its history, often it had alliance with Europe. And the moment the alliance was broken, it was very easy to sort of sweep into uh, its Russian territory. We think that as a result, they feel that they need uh, to put a, a barrier between themselves and the rest of Europe using the Eastern European countries, right? We think that coming out now specifically about uh, the context of the Soviet Union, coming out of the Soviet Union, their economy was based on weapons and oil, right? That means they don't have a lot of economic things to offer to the European Union. And we think that that means that they're not going to get a good say, conditions on the alliance and they can't get any leverage within the alliance. And they don't want to be part of an alliance that is strong. We also think seeing uh, um, the oligarchs were very strong. Uh, it is not likely that Russia would have become a democracy. And we think it's very hard to forge ties with the West when you're not a democracy. So we think it's likely Russia would have been aggressive regardless. Before we continue, does CG have a POI for us? Does OG? Yeah, this is entirely non-comparative, right? Like the fact that they have some incentives to expansionism means maybe they'll be expansionist on both sides. They can be different amounts of expansionist in proportion to the types of threats that they perceive. The thing is that they're going to try to have as much influence and as much power and conquer as much of Eastern Europe as they can, regardless of anything the West does. The question is whether the West is going to be there to protect these countries. And we think that the thing is that it is protecting these countries against it. First of all, exactly by the mechanism we told you in the rebuttal. Because when there is a French soldier standing on the border or a German soldier or a United States soldier standing on the border, and Russia knows that it cannot attack those countries because it risks getting not just into a small entanglement and all the 
countries like happened in Ukraine are going to say, oh no, I don't want to attack, but actually having the fear of war, right? We also think that, as we said, NATO is doing a lot of uh, 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 border patrols. Russia knows they're being watched. They can't uh, mount a surprise attack because uh, NATO also gathers a lot of intelligence. NATO today also does, as we said, a lot of cyber things to make sure that cyber attacks don't happen. So we think that they are actually crucial in protecting those countries against the Russian aggression, which would have happened regardless. For all these reasons, please oppose. Thanks for that, Deputy <laughs> Okay, so the OO case is at best like mitigation of our case, but at worst is like just completely uncomparative, right? Because notably at the end of their speech, maybe they've proven that Russia would have some incentives to like have expansionism on both sides, but they don't prove why like comparatively they're going to expand more in like the absence of NATO. And I think we proved to you pretty sufficiently why it's likely that like the optics of NATO make it so that Russia does things that they otherwise wouldn't. But secondarily, I think the other part of the OO case was this like premise on the idea that NATO is effective without having as, as any sense of mechanisms as to why it is that they actually do that and ignoring most of the work that Jacob does to prove to you why it is that due to the like group action problem, countries have an innate incentive to like not always utilize NATO, even if it is there. And typically uh, like is on net more ineffective than like alternative solutions would have been. I don't think OP actually did any work to prove to you the effectiveness of it. They just assert it um, and in many times it's untrue. Okay, I'm gonna talk about four things. First, like, is NATO even necessary with some like brief framing for the round? Um, so I'd say that like the ultimate like goals of NATO are just like having ultimate peace and stability. So I'd say given that there are probably like two questions in this debate. The first is like, are we able to like have like any peaceful amounts of like like we are able to have a mechanism for peace in the absence of NATO? Um, and if we prove that, then off us do a lot more to prove why NATO is unique. And then the second thing is, does NATO make it actively harder to solve for conflict and lead to more escalation? If we prove that, then it also means that NATO is actively bad at reaching its end goal of stability on either of those questions we've been able to win the round. So on the first question, is there a bit the ability for us to have alternative like peaceful mechanisms in the absence of NATO? So OP mainly here asserts the idea that countries aren't going to want to like form trade alliances without uh, like without um, NATO. And so it's unlikely that like the alternative mechs we propose would exist. So I have like a few responses to this. So the first thing I'd say, though, like in terms of like the EU, right? Like they were like a precursor to NATO um, and like pre-existed having like a lot, like some form of trade alliances even before like NATO was formed. But the second thing I'd say here is that the very fear that off outlines right off says there's like a massive fear of against like russia uh and given that like like we'd say like given that that fear is true it probably means that you would have formed some form of alternative alliance even in the absence of nato right because if that fear is present on either side we'd say in the absence of it you're still going to want to do something to protect your security we just say that you probably make those choices on a more individualistic level and less like explicitly anti-russia right so we'd say that like probably for the same reasons that nato like was formed in terms of wanting security all of that would be true as to why we get it on the comparative the third thing i'd say is just like in general um like free trade is like a thing that like countries want because oftentimes it, like drops the cost of goods and it's like better for people ultimately. So we say like trade alliances probably would have formed and like integrated economies also existed, which is a reason why you get like some form of like military, like, like s security alliance, because like if you're economically tied together, then you also don't like, you also don't want to be like hurt militaristically because like that's bad for you economically, right? So like those are the reasons as to why we're likely to get like some form of ability to like back yourself up in the absence of NATO. I think given that like office do a lot more to prove, given their own characterization that fear will exist, why countries without NATO are going to do absolutely nothing to protect their own security. But the reason why this also just isn't a wash is I think we proved to you why with NATO, given there's a false sense of security, it also means that countries status quo do less than they probably otherwise should to prioritize their own security because they fall back on a useless system. So we'd say like the absence of it is in fact better for you having your own ability to protect your nation. Okay, um, now I'm going to talk about like the effectiveness of NATO, uh, uh, sorry, the perception of NATO and the effort of it. Okay, so first in terms of the perception of NATO. Um, so I think here Op says that like Russia is going to do like expansionist stuff anyways. So I'm going to explain the comparative because I don't think that was really outlined. So we'd say that firstly, maybe in their best case, Russia does some of the expansion that they outlined. So maybe in their best case, like Russia is going to do things like they will um, expand ports and like annex Ukraine. But we'd say they're not going to go to the extent of like flipping elections in the UK um, or like the US or 
Spain because their incentives aren't optically as strong, right? Because notably, the mechs that we give you um, in PM that went unresponded to were this idea that when you have optically a large force of NATO against you, even if that force is ineffective, this is why this is not in clash with our, our case on why NATO is practically bad, but when it's optically like very large and poses a threat to you, you are going to want to have a proportionate response to that optics, which is why Russia does stuff above and beyond what they otherwise would. The second thing I'd say is in response to this idea of like you would conquer as much as you can, I'd say oftentimes military aggression is a zero sum game and almost always proportionate, which is why like the US didn't build 10,000 nuclear weapons during World War II, right? So I'd say that given that, like op can't just assert that Russia would expand like similarly, we'd say that proportionately they were, they expand a lot more um, in a world with NATO than a world without it. What are the impacts of that and how does that weigh into the round? I'd say that Russia's expansionism looks like um, like using like, uh, like, I, I don't know, it's like inflicting terror into like a lot of its like breakaway states to like try and like bring them back. It looks like increased radicalization of people to try and like propagate a pro-Russian narrative. It looks like increased like xenophobia and hatred. I'd say all of this undermines the enti entire principle of NATO because it undermines the ability to have peace and stability at the point in which Russia goes above and beyond what it otherwise would have. Given that, I think OO completely fails at characterizing it to any extent what the comparative would be. I'd say anything in terms of the optics of NATO fall to our side. Why is this comparatively different than having some other smaller forces. We'd say when something is not actively anti-Russia, the optics of needing a proportional response from Russia directly are less bad. But the second thing is any alternative force would probably be smaller, right? So we'd say that if you're making agreements as Jacob outlines with like a one-time case scenario, then it's like, you're just not going to like always be prepared. So it's not always like NATO versus Russia. But if you made like a one-time agreement on like a problem happening in, in like Iraq, let's say, um, we'd say that like you're going to get less of a proportionate response in that nature. But the last thing we tell you is that war is going to be probably less costly because you fewer countries going together just due to the nature that NATO is like um, every person has to like go like every country has to like protect each other. So we'd say that given that the proportionate responses are going to be smaller. So casualties will also be smaller on net because less people are going to uh, need like need to um, like need to like be engaging with that conflict. Um, okay. Uh, the last thing I'd say is that in terms of the Russia expansionism, I'd say this also like only weighs in around in the off bench if they're able to prove that you're successful at blocking expansionism. Otherwise, it just like massively fails because if Russia expands regardless, it's unclear NATO should give their efforts there. Given that like Russia has like, done a bunch of stuff without stopping, they, that falls. Okay, in terms of the effectiveness of, of NATO, um, op claims that our case on uh, NATO not working is factually untrue. Um, like they say that like when NATO countries are invaded, of course you back them up. But like Google, like for example, Russia Russia bombs Turkey right now and see that there is abs absent that there's like zero NATO response, right? This means office do a lot more to actually like impact why it is that NATO is going to respond every time that like one country is invaded. What are the max we give you as to why this is untrue? The first thing that uh, the first thing that Jacob talks to you about is that like oftentimes there is a like mutual defense is unlikely because it's very costly. So countries try to come up with reasons to like not go, not do it. But the second thing we tell you is that oftentimes it can be very dangerous so you don't do it. The last thing we tell you is that there's a group action problem where no one really like uniquely wants to do it. Okay, why are uh, why then are tensions likely to be um like the, uh, the last thing I just want to add here is I think that like in general like NATO countries are, like really bad at handling conflicts. Like the U.S. like invades in war and then like never pulls out. So we say like in general, they're probably a bad actor to be like running this. I think in the absence of NATO, you probably just get like less uh, propagation of conflict proposed. Thanks for that speech. And I invite the Deputy Leader of the Opposition to conclude the opening half of today's debate. Thank you. in three, two, one. Analysis of incentives does not just end with saying the words, this increases incentives, therefore it necessarily happens. Incentives are a balance, like actions are a balance between an incentive and a desire to do a thing and the likelihood of repercussions for doing a thing. That is what happens. Therefore, even if the government has proven, and we don't think they have, that NATO massively increases the incentive of Russia to take these attacks, when we show you that they have enough other incentives without it, but we're reducing their ability to destabilize, we're reducing their ability to aggress, we're reducing their ability to prey on weaker countries, that is the point at which we win this debate. 
nuanced analysis is what we're going for here. Let's talk about this on two levels. One, we're going to talk about the incentives for Russian aggression. Two, we're going to talk about the effectivity of stopping them. And three, if I have time, we're going to talk about where NATO has intervened in other places and why having that as a body is a positive thing. So let's talk about each of those. One, on this incentive for Russian aggression. So let's start. We got told from opening government of the following idea. Look, NATO makes them more aggressive because they optically are seen as this actively anti-Russia. And so the second they come any, in any way close to Russia, the Russia feels the need to respond because of optics. This is really the extent of the analysis that we got from them. We say to this several responses, right? One, we think that this is not and has never been the ethos of NATO in the sense that there's no reason why Russia should even optically believe that they are actively going to attack them or anything like that. They have never done that in the past and that is not the way in which they present themselves as not the ethos. This is particularly true now in, in a situation in which governments themselves tell you that a lot of these countries don't want to be actively taking part in wars or whatever that they have no interest in, that they have no buying for, for their own community, etc., etc. It is not clear why the optics are in any way as they say they are if they attempt to strike the deal with the Ukraine or why anyone inside Russia therefore requires them to attack back. But second of all, we tell you that in terms of the comparative, we think that this is just simply not to the main incentive. Because we think even if you don't have NATO there, Russia has a million reasons to be anti the West in terms of the fact that they are way, way more economically powerful than them and they want to actively destabilize them because of all of the things that NATO tells you about in terms of their relative comparative power, in terms of the fact that they're not a democracy and that they fear EU intervention, EU attempting to make them a democracy or trying to pull power, power wow, well, and trying to use that power against them, just like, for instance, China has incentives to destabilize the West, despite there not being an anti-China alliance, because they have the exact same incentives in terms of not being aligned with their ideology, in terms of fearing them in the future, because Russia has been hit many, many, many times in the past, and they are wary of and aware that this is a possibility, even if it's not an express desire right now, which is they have have reason to fortify themselves. They want to expand their borders to allow for themselves a room for error in such a situation in which the West decides to attack in the future because of all of the reasons that it gives them in terms of economic stability and ports and access to things that they otherwise don't have. All of the analysis that NATO tells you and just gets zero response. What we don't get from government is enough of a reason as to why the optics of NATO are enough to actually make a difference, right? On the other hand, what we tell you is that what we get here is that we actually just do it much better, right? We actually protect these people that otherwise the Russia anyway has an incentive to address again, and we're actually able to manage to stop a lot of their aggression we're able to limit it and push back. And so we say, given that they have all of these incentives to address anyway, given that NATO makes a very little difference to them in that context and in the way in which they view this, we think we're in a better So let's talk about their effectivity, because here's what we got told in terms of why they're so ineffective. One, we got told, no, they simply do nothing. There's no buy-in, so nothing happens there, right? They just ignore all of that analysis of why it's not true in terms of the fact that you're literally putting troops on the ground there, which makes it very difficult for you to ignore. If they attack a British soldier, Britain has to fight back. Same with the US. This is what NATO does, and this is how it works in terms of putting those patrols and putting those alliances on the ground. Second of all, we think that there's a question here of time, right? Even if government's case is correct in this exact moment in which Trump is particularly erring on the side of not being certain about NATO, et cetera, et cetera, this hasn't been true for all of the years up to now. It's very possible that it will no longer be true the second he's out of office. We don't think this is a magic thing that, solves, that stops all the benefits that NATO have brought until this point. But also we just think facts on the ground are very much on our side because there's a reason that Russia only attacked Ukraine and didn't attack Estonia. If they really thought there was no buy-in, then they then they would have done it. But the reason there's a difference here is because you don't need to be sure. And this is important. Even when we're questioning, even when there's a possibility that NATO won't come through, if there's a probability that maybe the US and the UK and Canada are going to come to your doorstep, you don't attack. That's when you are on the side of caution. And that is what NATO works on, because you don't want to mess with world nuclear powers. And so you say, OK, maybe maybe they won't have buy-in, but maybe they will if we kill one of their soldiers. And that is the point at which you don't take it. Last thing we tell you, all the mechanisms in terms of intelligence Do gathering. I? on cyber, all of these things are things that are happening now, and they're working towards to protect these countries from cyber attacks that will, that will take out their electricity or their water supplies, only those things. These are things that we're doing. We think, therefore, that we get a, more, a better, much, much better, better defense on the comparative. The second one we tell you, they try and tell you, this creates a false sense of security. One, given that we explained how it actually secures, this is just not true. But second of all, we don't understand why they think governments are so stupid. If they really are worried that NATO won't help them, then they'll put their money somewhere else. We don't think, we don't know why they think this is a likely scenario, why people are going to buy into this false sense if it actually doesn't happen. But more than that, lastly, we tell you that insofar as they're built on mechanisms of other alliances having been formed in terms of being able to protect these smaller countries, NATO explains to you, one, why it's incredibly unlikely in terms of the fear of these alliances in the first place and why only when you give them this level of military protection, they're willing to take them. Two, they never explain to us why, if that smaller alliance also is military protection, again, includes military protection against the United States, we're not sure why this against Russia, we're not sure why this comparative is less likely to 
expansion or expansionist desire from the uh, from the Russians or anything along those lines. Before I get on to explain why this is just going to win us the debate, I will take closing if you have a few lines. Uh, would you not agree that there is a general audacity from Russia to undermine, if not challenge, U.S. security, U.S. military strength and capacity in the present? Yes, there is a desire for Russia to do that. And we think that desire would exist on both sides of the house for all the reasons that we explained. And we think that NATO makes it harder for them to do that in terms of providing more protection and more intelligence across the board and more alliances between various countries that allow them to better protect themselves. Okay, cool. Let's understand the massive impact of this. Because we think that at the end of the day, what you get is one, a much a situation in which you are much less likely, and we do not currently see significant Russian aggression of the literal invasion of all of the NATO countries that we're protecting. That's Estonia, that's Latvia, that's all of those countries that we think otherwise could have literally been invaded, or if not far from more destabilized, then they are in the, are in the status quo. We think we're getting them more technology and more democracy and all of those things. We think that, that we're also just stopping the expansion of an incredibly dangerous and powerful enemy that has the, the potential to challenge us and has the potential to destabilize many, many more of these countries and also spread their ideology, which is anti-democratic and harmful to us. We think that at the end of the day, the fact that NATO has been able to literally just save thousands of lives on our side of the house and ensure the continued stability and growth of these populations is a big enough impact for us to win this debate for all those reasons. Thank you. Thanks for that speech. And I'd like to welcome the closing government member to open the closing half of today's debate. Uh, am I audible? Okay, great. I'm just getting my timer ready. Okay. Panel, I think that at a point where the opening opposition bases their entire argument on the efficacy of NATO, the POI that my partner asks is incredibly important because what is being asked is if Russia is so emboldened to interfere in US elections, if they are so emboldened to kill US soldiers and not fear any repercussions, then what kind of security does NATO really provide at a point where the entire opening opposition makes a concession that the security that is provided by NATO is that European or Eastern, or Eastern European countries get proximity to bigger militaries such as the US? The nuance here is we need to understand that the efficacy of NATO does not actually exist in the realm that the opening opposition is arguing, because their only analysis really is to say that big militaries require actually give you more protection against Russia without any kind of understanding of whether that actually has happened. The only thing that they argue is an argument of from ignorance where they say, well, it's likely that Russia would be far more expansionist in the absence of NATO without any real uh, analysis under that. So let's tackle that. The first thing we need to understand in today's debate is would Russia likely be more expansionist in the absence of NATO? A couple of points of response to this. Firstly, we think that this isn't necessarily the case, right? Because the, fa the fact that the USSR fell meant that Russia made a concession to abandon their very, their their attempts of massive ex expansionism. Instead, they rather focused on things like establishing global hegemony through things like, like monopolizing the space race, through heavy investments in technology, through heavy investments in forming alliances, diplomatic alliances, and economic alliances, similar to how a lot of other countries who are now global hegemonies took that route. What that means is it means that it's not true that Russia would be that expansionist in the absence of NATO. What can we deduce from this? Firstly, we think that Russia is likely to not, not been that expansionist for a couple of reasons. Firstly, because under their own characterization, expansionism is incredibly expensive. So in the absence of NATO, there wouldn't have been as great of a precedence to invest and continue investing in military in the absence of such a big threat, which is NATO. Because recognize, under their own characterization, they say NATO is a threat. They also say that Russia had to abandon its previous USSR because it couldn't afford to keep that afloat. So the logical conclusion there is to say the only reason then that they could justify continued spending in expansionism is if there was a big enough threat that could actually justify continued spending in something that they'd already made a concession to abandon. But secondly, we also think that it's unlikely because we think that number one, in the current political realm that we're existing in, it is a very unpopular route to take. For example, Germany that has a history of vast expansionism goes through a lot of lengths 
to sanitize that history. Because having a history of expansionism within the current global context where individuals have significant ability to form alliances and form military alliances with people in the absence of NATO even, means that it's unlikely that this would be a popular uh, uh, route to take, right? We know this also because Russia goes through a lot of, through, through many lengths, both in its academic system and also in its public image to sanitize its reputation of the USSR, which means it's unlikely that they would continue to have an expansionist effort, particularly at a point where they disband, this, where they disbanded the USSR, right? But thirdly, we also think that they advisedly made concessions to join organizations and be very prevalent organizations like the UN, whose entire basis is the, whose entire basis is the concession of having things like international law that prevents annexation. The only reason then that Russia has a reason to continue things like annexation where it's made concessions to abandon that through their organizations, but also through the disbandment of the USSR is important because it shows that the only reason that they really had a, a urgency to invade Ukraine was when Ukraine was threatened by joining the, the by joining NATO. And that's then where they seize the opportunity to annex Ukraine. We think that's particularly important. But secondly, then, we think that there's many reasons why NATO is not necessarily effective, right? We think that this is quite flippantly ignored by the opening opposition when they say, well, like things like the USSR has, has invested, or rather that Russia has invested in things like cyber attacks and NATO has countedly also invested in things like cyber attacks. We don't necessarily think that that's true, right? Because we don't think that NATO bases majority of its strength in developing more, uh, more, uh, uh, or rather in evolving their military approach. We think that predominantly they spend severely on their military and we think that this is vastly ineffective. And the proof of this is shown in their own examples where they show that Russia continues to meddle in elections, Russia continues to meddle in uh, cyber attacks. And we think by virtue of the fact that, all that exists shows that NATO is not effective in tackling those kinds of attacks. But lastly then, we think it's incredibly important that we recognize the internal struggles that exist within NATO that make it a vastly ineffective uh, uh, strategy of tackling Russia, right? The reason for this panel is because we think that NATO forms alliances between countries that are no longer aligned. An example of this is Turkey and the US. Turkey and the US vary significantly in their ideological approach to militarization. An example of this again is their involvement in Syria. The reason this is important is it's important that we understand that countries within NATO are unlikely to come to resolutions that are going to be beneficial for all countries, number one, because they have very, there's a conflict of interest that exists between them, because in other spaces and in most spaces, they are in fact like against each other in terms of militarization. But we think that becomes particularly important because it means that they're unable to reach conclusions and decisions that are necessary, particularly when Russia launches an attack that requires an urgent response. We think that the urgency of responsiveness of militarization isn't achieved when you have actors that are severe, that are essentially against each other and are unable to reach mutual agreements because they're not ideologically aligned. But secondly, we think this becomes important because we think that the internal conflict of NATO undermines its own efficacy. We have people like Manuel Macron who openly say that NATO is ineffective and has severe internal conflicts. This undermines the efficacy of NATO because it means that at a point where you have created a political environment where your military is the only defense you have to Russia, at a point where, that's in, where the integrity of that institution is undermined by the leaders of that institution so openly, we think it undermines the efficacy that NATO has in uh, asserting its uh, military power within that space. But then we think that the internal conflict of the, the internal conflict of NATO becomes particularly important and to reach mutual Czechoslovakia bear the burden of financially supporting an institution that doesn't serve their own own interest. We think that NATO is in a particularly volatile place, able to be accountable to NATO as an organization. But secondly, we think it means that smaller countries bear the brunt of supporting financially the militarization of these countries at their own expense. What this means, panel, is it means that it creates a very unsustainable mechanism in which smaller countries are burdened with financially supporting individuals like Trump who have been proven to be reckless in, declar in their declarations of wars and their involvement of wars in places where they're not necessarily likely to win, nor they are important. We think this becomes important because we think that NATO is an ineffective mechanism, but more than that, it becomes a liability to smaller states very proud to uh, propose. Thanks for that speech. Closing opposition member. Can everyone hear me? Good, 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 good. 
It seems like closing government, for one, brought into Russian propaganda. They thought that just because Russia joined the UN, which I want to point out the Soviet Union was a founding member of and had a seat on the UN Security Council since like the 1950s, they thought just, just because Russia joined the UN, just because they joined some international institutions, it signaled their unwillingness to engage in expansion. Aside from the vastly derivative content that you heard from closing government, there were two things that were unique. Then I'm going to talk about the CO extension. The second thing that we heard from closing of government was just to say that it was a bad thing that you had institutions that weren't aligned with each other, a la Turkey and the United States. This is a good thing. And I want to be clear about why this is the case, because what NATO does is it massively reduces the chances that small nations end up going to war with each other, because if they are bound by these same mutual defense treaties and they all want protection from Russia, they are far less likely to just randomly go to war with each other, which is why the examples don't stand, i.e. when Turkey and Greece disagree with each other, they are far less likely to bash it out because now they know that if they do that, they won't be a part of NATO anymore. The second thing to say here is just, I think their point about urgency is wrong. It's not true that you need consensus voting to do stuff in NATO. NATO just because Macron says something random means nothing. For what it's worth, France didn't participate in like the call to action that the United States had in the 2000s, yet NATO still like NATO still went into Iraq as a whole, like the mutual defense stuff still stood, like NATO still worked. The last thing they say is just that smaller countries are the ones that are burdened with defense for things like Trump. This is definitely untrue. We know this because Trump is continually complaining about paying the largest share of NATO, but more importantly, smaller countries are the ones who are most at risk of things like Russia, which is why ex ante, even without NATO, been, uh, like, like Estonia, Latvia would have been paying massive amounts of money anyway. The arguments that closing government gives you are ahistoric and incorrect. The extension, I want to be clear, is extraordinarily simple. The extension is just going to be about how the uh, Balkans and the Eastern Europe as a whole would have been a terrible place. They never would have liberalized and they would have all broken out into much more civil war than they did in the counterfactual. The first thing I want to say here is I want to give a link beyond what opening opposition did and prove why this takes it over opening government. Because the failure of opening government has been to assume that ad hoc security alliances emerge out of nowhere. But there is literally no justification for this. Like panel, if you listen to what opening government said, they just said, ah, uh, there are security problems. I'm sure a security thing will emerge at some point, or I'm sure a trade deal will emerge at some point. But they give you literally no reason why that was the case. There are two reasons why these concerns never manifest. The first is the lack of trust. And I want to be clear here. You're talking about 1991, 1992, post-Soviet breakaway states that are all messed up on like random ethnic and state lines. Like the divisions of the state that separate Yugoslavia from Czechoslovakia are quite literally arbitrary. And in the vast majority of these cases, what this means is that you have artificial competition between these breakaway republics that manifest in ethnic ties and state tensions. It is the dissolution of Yugoslavia and Czechoslovakia in the 90s that meant that it wasn't clear that the Czech Republic and Slovakia trusted each other. It wasn't clear that Serbia and Montenegro trusted each other. It wasn't clear that Latvia and Lithuania trusted each other. And this is the reason that independent ad hoc security alliances don't emerge. The problem, unlike what opening opposition posits, is not just that they are tired or afraid of Russia, which makes sense because Russia in the 90s has literally no money and literally no army. The problem is that they are afraid of each other. This is why NATO is the only solution, because you don't have the ability to form broad trade alliances or specific security arrangements. One, what you need to do with NATO is you need to convince states that they have a broader goal by tying it into Russia. You need to convince them that they shouldn't be scared of each other, but they should still be scared of Russia. And that's the only way that you mitigate the worst harms that come out of civil wars in Yugoslavia. Two, what you do is you give a broad multilateral backing to defense claims. So Bosnia is less afraid of Albania when they think that they're both NATO members and both have to participate in the same institution in the same security alliance. And three, the only way you get credence for any of these deals is by allowing big hegemons to provide credence to these institutions. Notice, panel, that they never give you reasons as to why the United States or the UK or France or any other big nations like that would want to engage in these random security relationships with Latvia. Like, there is no reason for them unless there is an anti-Soviet claim that they have. The US does not ex-anti-care about Bosnia. They need to be motivated. They need NATO opening. 
Okay, so we explained why they would have formed. Like, firstly, we explained that independent alliances outside of NATO have historically emerged, which is actually true. Second, that they like trade alliances pre existed NATO, so it's in their best interest to have also security. And thirdly, that the fears like, you outlined, the reasons why they would form, and, and their reasons also why, like, the US might wrong. want to like, back up like, and drop human rights abuses. Like, guys, the EU was formed in 1993. You can't just lie and get away with it. And if you want to ask us to Google stuff, I, I think that goes against you because Russia isn't bombing Turkey like they're bombing Syria. Those are two different countries. Get your facts right. At best, what they posit to you is just there are independent reasons that random states want to join up. Fine. Yeah, maybe they're right. Maybe Serbia and like Slovakia want to join up or Slovenia and Latvia want to join up. But what you needed when you wanted to avert the Yugoslav wars was you needed all the states in the entire like Balkan area to join up together. You didn't just need the random odd security alliances between one state and another state, because that's how you get a world war, guys, except like in the Yugoslav regions instead. Like what you have on their side, if you just allowed independent security alliances to form, is you have them forming between individual states that then form cleavages in the entire Balkan states. So you don't get the Balkan states unifying against Russia and in the back of the US, you get them fighting against each other. And this is terrible. This is Bosnia, Kosovo, Yugoslavia, but on much wider realms. And this is massively mitigated. The point that when Eastern European nations are brought into NATO, they are more likely to trust each other, which is why you have nations like Estonia and Latvia forming better ties, something opening posits, but never points out. The second thing to say here is just that we get vastly better democratization and liberalization. States don't just join the EU randomly or arbitrarily. They join because they want security agreements and they want security arrangements. And the way that you convinced people to democratize in Poland, in Hungary, in the Czech Republic in the 90s was by saying, we will give you protection from your neighbors, but more importantly, we will include you in this broad security alliance. So it is not just the fear of Russia, it is the fear of your neighbors, which is something that only CO points out. The last thing to say here is just on non-proliferation. And this is small, but I think it's genuinely quite important. Like, let it not be noted that 45,000 nuclear weapons were in Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Ukraine at the time of the fall of the Soviet Union. That is 45,000 loose nuclear weapons in these random states. And they could have held on to it, but the reason they didn't is because they were assured things like NATO protection. It was Belarus knowing that even though it wasn't ever going to join NATO, it still received some modicum of protection. It was Ukraine being offered the guarantee of, the, uh, of NATO support. It was Kazakhstan being part of NATO's PFP and willingly engaging and giving up its nuclear arsenal and modernizing as a result. Very, very proud to oppose. Thanks for that speech. The closing government whip to conclude the coverage. Hello, am I audible to everyone? Okay, I am going to put it on color view. Okay, sorry, please pardon me while I just quickly set up my papers. Panel, the room of debates has become threefold. And the first matter that we have to attend to is the idea on the practical impact of influence of uh, the continued existence of NATO influencing uh, relations between smaller states. What we essentially get from closing uh, government is that sta smaller states, satellite states specifically, um, from the USSR would likely be hostile to each other and that these smaller states don't necessarily trust each other and that they needed a body that would more or less uh, facilitate uh, more friendly, more diplomatic relations between each other, which is the specific significance of NATO. 
The first thing that we have in response here is that they needed to tell us that there is a world where conflict would continue to occur arbitrarily without any organization or state having some incentive to intervene. Because we think it's weird that they characterize these states as states that are more or less isolated from the rest of the politics of the global community. We don't think that this is likely. Firstly, from the analysis that Anam gives you, where she tells you that states that have either been a dominant party in expansionist policies or states that have suffered ramifications or have been a part of such party. These states are often viewed with great scrutiny in the global community because of the kind of historic because of the kind of history that they share. So what this means is that there isn't a world where states that were satellite states of the USSR or Russia itself would not necessarily be viewed with significant scrutiny. More specifically, we'd say because of the proximity of the states to other countries, for example, countries that are part of the EU, for example, how close Czechoslovakia is to Germany, for instance, we say that there is a world where because of their proximity to states that formed part of other bigger organizations that have the capacity to intervene, such as the EU, we would likely see a world where those bigger organizations also intervene in that particular state. The basic premise here is that there isn't a world where conflict occurs arbitrarily without an incentive for groups that are in proximity to intervene, right? But secondly, we'd say that even in the instance of the NATO, we'd say that internal conflicts undermine the very powerful capacity of NATO as a broader organization to keep these, to keep these smaller states in check as well as to give them an incentive to continue to cooperate together. So whereas the organization has come to a point where it does not have great significance, where, it is, where its capacity is undermined in the present, we say that their ability to argue that it is this um, strong is specifically questionable. But thirdly and lastly, we would say that the increase in democracy in the present means that it has by extension created the formation of diplomatic relationships. But more importantly, we say that the interrelated nature of trade means that there isn't a state that can successfully survive in operating uh, just essentially in isolation from other states, especially states that are in proximity to it, specifically the satellite states of the USSR. So we say that because of the inherently interrelated nature of trade, for example, there's also an independent desire or other um, influence on these states to uh, to have more pass to have more um, to have more cooperative relations as opposed to completely just uh, choosing to uh, to to observe each other through hostility, right? The second point that we then have to look at in this debate is the present day utility of NATO in direct clash with opening. So what they first tell us is that countries, um, so what they first tell us is that countries won't want to form economic uh, relations outside of NATO, something that is also tied to what closing tells you. On top of what opening's response was, what we'd say is that the interdependent nature of trade, again, also specifically means that states have a comparative advantage in, where states have a comparative advantage in a market, they would likely want to trade in order for them to maximize the kind of benefits that they have access to, which means that we'd say that trade would nevertheless still happen even outside of NATO. But the second response, and on the greater um, utility of NATO an extension. What Anam tells you is that she characterizes how the nature of conflict in the present has significantly changed. So this is to say, at, on top of just the room or rather the, the, the creation of the necessity for states to cooperate, the specific utility of NATO, which was to essentially create the security of states cooperating together to counter a significant threat against one of their own, has largely been undermined. And especially if that was the very purpose of the institution of NATO. Of NATO. This is to say there is a practical incapacity of NATO to have significant utility in the present. And this is specifically because the threshold for collective response is contingent on a def on a defined military threat of large proportions that would necessitate states to collaborate in bringing their resources together to combat the threat however if they also concede for example that the nature of uh, the th of threats that exist in the present are no longer the same we say that at the very least it means that nato is no longer effective in responding to the threats that exist in the present this looks like russia meddling in elections this looks like um bounty hunters on american military we say that effectively it means that Russia or other NATO is no longer of significant utility in the present. Before I proceed, I'll take a pure eye from OO.
After 1991, Russia still had vast military capabilities. Neta explains to you why Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania would never have entered these trade agreements if they haven't gotten the promise of military protection NATO provided from them and thus gained all of the capabilities. So what you... What that argument still doesn't address is why states wouldn't likely want to intervene even outside of NATO. Anam characterizes this in his speech, that there will likely always be a reason for states to intervene even outside the bigger banner of an organization such as NATO. She told you of the scrutiny within which states that were historically involved with expansionism, uh, expansionism are looked at, but extensively, we also tell you of the inherent, um, what's this, the inherent demand of countries that are hegemonic like the United States to intervene in instances where there's conflict so that they're able to mediate that kind of situation. So we say that even in this world where there isn't NATO, we would likely see intervention in those specific situations, right? So essentially, on extension, what Anna also tells you is that there is specific what NATO does is that it creates an instance where there is a, a vacuum in power right but this is specifically tied to the clash that to the second argument that opposition brings where they tell us that Russia will always be expansionist and therefore um, that NATO is specifically important for reducing the ability of Russia to execute and amplify its expansion firstly Anam tells you that if they concede to the fact that expansionism is expensive then there would likely have to be a significant reason that Russia would want to be a part of to want to continue expansionism but what we tell you in extension is that the continued existence of NATO whereas the, the USSR and the Warsaw Pact have been dissolved means that there is a power vacuum that necessitates Russia to want to amplify its power and its ability to defend itself in the absence of that there isn't a vacuum of power on behalf of Russia therefore the very existence of the USSR is what creates that vacuum and therefore that justification for expansionism very proud to propose. Thanks for that speech. I'd like to welcome the closing opposition member to so closing opposition whip to conclude today's debate. Uh, yeah. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No, don't worry about it. Great. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. There is a strange tension at closing and opening government where they say, you know what, we're still going to have tons of intervention and it's definitely gonna be by the US, but this isn't gonna provoke Russia at all, especially not if the US is intervening to stop conflicts in Bosnia and Ukraine. The failure is that this is preempted in closing opposition extension. What we tell you is quite simple. One, it is genuinely hard to convince big states like the United States to intervene. There is a reason that they intervened in Bosnia and not in Rwanda, because they had NATO interests in Bosnia and Kosovo that they did not in Rwanda. And that's the important part, which we tell you that the only way that any of these security alliances gain credibility from external actors that are removed from the region is when you have explicit NATO allies and explicit NATO ties that keep these big actors invested. The second thing to say here is just on all the responses that closing government gives as to why you have a world in which conflict would occur or why you have a world in which internal conflict obviously won't occur. I think the important thing is this panel, you should already know factually that in Yugoslavia, in the Balkans, in Bosnia, you did have conflict continuing to occur. The comparative was when NATO actually intervened, they did so because they were motivated by the fact they had NATO allies, and NATO countries in the region, things they didn't do elsewhere, which is why you had not intervention in Rwanda. But even if they're correct, and you could somehow get forces of UN peacekeepers to intervene in Bosnia, that is fine. Because the extension said that didn't matter. What mattered is that these countries never went to war in the first place. So the problem with the closing government response, which was just to say that you had to prove that conflict couldn't be solved by someone else is that is fine. What we told you is that maybe conflict will be solved by someone else after the conflict is already broken out, but by then it is too late. What we wanted to do was construct meaningful security alliances that stop this before it happens in the first place. The last thing they said was just, well, they formed trade relationships anyway but they didn't engage with the context of this, which is that you have states that are autocratic and don't trust each other. They are built off of fragmented ethnic and political lines. They have no incentive to trade, so they never trade. They never form the meaningful relationships that they have, except for the three things that Aditya told you at extension, which was one, you had to convince states that they had a broader goal by tying it into the anti-Russian sphere. And two, you had to give them the credibility of large states like the United States that wanted to defend people because there was no reason for the US to otherwise defend Bosnia. The impacts of this were enormous, and I want to be clear here about why this wins the round in and of itself. 
because both teams on top half already conceded that one, expansionism exists on either side. The question is just how far Russia goes. And two, that Russian expansionism is limited. Like if you understand what Top App is saying, they never make claims that Russia is going to go to war with someone else on either side of the house. Like Russia is never going to fight all out wars. The determination is does Russia meddle a little bit more in Britain's elections or a little bit more in Georgia's Republic. But what we gave you on closing opposition was two clear harms. One, you fought fewer wars because more Yugoslavian nations trusted each other. They didn't want to go to war with each other because they didn't fear each other. And two, there were literally clear delineations about whether or not these institutions wanted democracy in the first place. I want to pause this to you. You're a former Soviet state. You are an autocrat. You have literally no reason to give up your power, except that you're kind of afraid of Russia. And if the only condition that people have for forming security alliances with you is they say, well, we want you to liberalize and democratize, that is the only point which you are ever willing to democratize and liberalize, meaning that we give you the ability for these countries to be democratic, best thing that we have, opening government, sure. Okay, so trade would still happen because countries benefit from it. And UNCO asserting that the military NATO is the only reason for alliance is just a straight up lie. Given that, you should probably weigh the increased expansion of Russia, which has massive harms on stability and peace, and people deprioritizing their security when they have a false sense of it um, over any like minimal maybe benefit of like NATO when you never prove efficacy of it on the entire op bench. So it seems to me, uh, if you just think about this for a second, uh, what you had in the context of the former Soviet states were a bunch of states that didn't trust each other and didn't want to trade with each other. But yes, maybe some states wanted to trade with each other, fine. The point is, there was not broad trust across Yugoslavia or the Balkans as a whole. There was not broad trust around Eastern Europe as a whole. What we wanted on closing opposition was to unify all these states against Russia. That is a good thing. That is what we get. And the second thing to say here is just, yes, they are correct. Trade is not the reason why people join NATO, fine. But the reason that people were willing to democratize is because NATO made it a precondition of ascension in NATO, that people wanted to join NATO's partnership for peace. So they were like, yes, yes, we will democratize, we will liberalize. That is why Poland's autocrats stepped down. That is why Hungary's autocrats stepped down. That is a good thing. I wanna talk about government bench and the sophistry of thinking that Russia is actually a credible threat. One, on the election interference stuff, and this will turn their argument, I think gives us independent winning material in and of itself. What they had to prove to you on their side was that Russia was not going to do this. Like, even if they are correct in saying that Russia has no incentive to meddle with Britain, I think they have strong incentives to meddle with these smaller post-Soviet states. And the reason you just think about this kind of intuitively is because if you're thinking about Russia at its 90s, it is literally at the lowest amount of its power. Like, they are terrible, and all the people are like, we want to go back to the Soviet Union when we were so great and so powerful, which is why you had the rise of right-wing Russian reactionaries. It wasn't just because of NATO. It was because people were tired of being poor and tired of being hungry, and they were like, we want to be the big USSR again. That is why people independently pushed for Russian nationalism. What is the comparative then? I think no matter what you do, whether it's to benefit the ethnic Russians in Georgia or Ukraine, or whether it's to benefit like the sense of Russian nationalism you have, Russia will always want to intervene in some level in the neighboring states. What we do then is we give incentives for big states to protect them. Because it's not like Britain ever cared about Estonian elections. The reason they now care about Estonian elections is because if the power in Estonia changes, then the power of NATO changes as a whole. When Estonia becomes a little more pro-Russia, then NATO gets a little tilted as well. So Britain, America, all these countries are much more willing to help all the smaller states in dealing with their independent problems when making sure that terrorism doesn't pop out in small nations in NATO because they say you are a part of NATO it matters that your elections are free and fair. And this I think is the most important thing because it was correct on opening government to say that Russia has some ability to meddle with people. They will do that on either side. And I think it's probably a good thing they don't go to open war with people. The comparative that opening opposition did not give is when do you give big countries the incentive to enforce good norms in these institutions, to stop terrorism problems in Ukraine because they say Ukraine is a NATO ally, we should protect them, we should engage with them. And I think that is the biggest problem because maybe it was true. And you have to believe a lot of things to believe government bench in this debate. You have to believe that Russia was just never going to expand and never going to engage, which seems incoherent, especially when you think about the way that nationalism happens and the way that expansionism would want to happen in their side of the house. The last thing to say here is just on opening opposition. The problem with opening opposition is the extent of argumentation that they had was just to say Russia exists and it is bad and NATO mediates that. 
The point that we gave was that it has nothing to do with Russia, but it is literally just about you trusting your neighbor or not trusting your neighbor in and of itself. We won the round on that. Very, very proud to oppose. Thanks for that. That brings a conclusion to the debate. So we'll now spend our time deliberating. We'll call you back into the room, whether that be the breakout room or here, whenever we are ready. Um, and um, 